Welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graham Hill. Elia Shakur was the Archbishop of Akko, Haifa, Nazareth and all Galilee from 2006 to 2014. He's worked tirelessly for reconciliation between Arabs and Jews in the Middle East. He wrote Blood Brothers and We Belong to the Land, books that have received wide acclaim. Shakur is a recipient of the World Methodist Peace Prize and the Wano Peace Prize for his work in education as the founder of the Ma Elias educational institutions, which have more than 3,000 students from Muslim, Christian, Druze and Jewish backgrounds. He's committed to peace and reconciliation. He describes himself as a Palestinian, Arab, Christian, Israeli. Elia Shakul, welcome to the Global Church Project. Thank you for coming to see us. Thank you. In Blood Brothers, you talk about your childhood and your journey into the priesthood. Can you tell us a little bit about the story of your childhood and how that led to a commitment to the priesthood? That's a very long story. Yeah. You know, I was born in Upper Galilee, near Mount Canaan, yeah. from we could see the Lake of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. Yeah. And I was born in a Christian family. I think I started learning about Christ being my champion, my compatriot, from my mother and father. Mm. They were very committed Christians, and they never looked at Jesus Christ as being only the Son of God coming on earth, but they looked at him as a compatriot, as another man from Galilee. Mm. It's there that I started to love Christ, to learn about him. And after we have been deported from our village, after the village was destroyed, and our land confiscated by the Israeli army, my father never lost his faith. He insisted that he wanted one of his children to be a priest. And he tried with my elderly brother, sent him to seminary. He stayed three months and went away. He did not want to hear about that business. Good for him. He made a beautiful family. My second brother threatened to commit suicide if father would send him to seminary. He did not want to hear about that. My third brother escaped from family, crossed the Jordan River, and went far away to the Jordanian Bedouin tribes, to a tribe with whom we have some very far relations. And he took refuge there, escaping to be sent to seminary. And three months later, father found him. He went to bring his child back home. He did not want to come. He said, I will not come unless you promise. In front of all these Bedouin dignitaries, you would not send me to seminary. And father promised in order to recuperate his child, who remained the youngest. I was the youngest. <laughs> So father delivered me the bishop who took me to Haifa where I finished my elementary school studies and I finished high school in Nazareth. And meanwhile, I developed this yearning to be a priest. It was not, nothing imposed on me. It was something that became wished for. And uh, when I finished high school, I was determined to become a priest if God wants me. And the bishop needed to send me to seminary. Normally he would have sent me to Jerusalem, where we have a major seminary. But Jerusalem was still under Jordanian occupation. So we needed an exit visa from Israel to Jordan, and we needed an entrance visa from Jordan to go inside. And both government answered the bishop's request with similar answers. The Jordanians said, sorry, we can't accept already corrupted Arabs with Zionism to come and live in our, in our place. And Israel said absolutely the same thing. We cannot allow our Arabs to go to the Arab countries and be corrupted with Arab ideology. So the bishop was confused what to do. He had a choice. 
either to send us to Rome where there are plenty of possibilities or to send us to Paris. And I'm very, very grateful that the bishop chose Paris, not Rome. I don't like to study in Paris. And I was sent to Paris for six years. My God, what did we not study during six long years in the Sorbonne and the Institute Catholic? Everything that has to do with priesthood, with church history, with sacraments, with theology, with philosophy, archaeology, genealogy, everything, everything. And now I can tell you, even publicly on TV, I'm very grateful that I have already forgotten everything, everything. I only remember two points from my studies. God does not kill, God is love. That's all I remember, that's all I need for prison. And after six years of studying in Paris, I came back home and was ordained priest in 1965. This is how I became a priest. And what key experiences shaped your commitment to peacemaking and to nonviolence? It's my experience in the family. We were living very peacefully in our village, poorly but extremely happy. And we prepared ourselves to welcome Jews coming from we don't know where. Father said, these are survivors of a certain satanic plan in Europe, aiming at destroying the Jews. And thank God, the plan was destroyed, and many Jews were saved, and survivors might be coming to our village in a few days. We need to show them that somewhere in this, in this world they are welcome because they are our blood brothers. We protested, Father, how comes? Jews be our blood brothers? It's impossible. He said, mm -hmm. yes, children, they are our blood brothers because they are the children, descendants, as we are, of a certain Iraqi citizen called Abraham. So your parents' faith and devotion had a big impact on you then? Yes, very much so. Mm. Mainly my mother's. Mm. And what led you to found Ma Elias Institutions? Oh, that was not in my studies in the university. It was not, was, it was not included in my plan to be a priest. It was a local need that was born in 1981. Because I used, it's a long story, I used to organize summer camps for our kids. Because our community was a very young community. Imagine, 75% of our people were under 27 years old. And 50% were under 14 years old. I said to myself, our future with the surrounding Jewish villages, towns and settlements would depend on the quality of education we give to our children. And I consecrated my life to help to serve the children. And uh, I used to organize summer camps, every year one summer camp. The first summer camp I imagine, I remember, was with 1,100 27 children. Mm. Every year the number doubled and tripled, quadrupled, till 1980, when my assistants registered over 5,000 children. Mm. You know, for 5,000, it's a big, big enterprise to prepare sandwiches and drinks for every day, for three weeks. I remember, never forgot that I am another man from Galilee. You know who is the man from Galilee, right? Mm. Jesus Christ. When I dare say I'm another man from Galilee, it's too much pretending. But that's the only way I could get out from that, feed five thousands, not once, three times a day for three consecutive weeks. Mm. One day I was sitting there confused, how can I feed these people? It's impossible. And I don't do any miracle. I don't know how people do miracles. Yeah. I pray and I believe in the prayers and the power of prayer and the inspiration God gives you. One evening I was sitting after prayer, I said to myself, 
but you're confused. Why do you forget that every one of these children has a very loving mother? Call for help, call the mothers for help. That meant I needed to organize 30 meetings in the 30 different villages where from the children came for the summer camp. I had no other alternatives. I organized 30 meetings in one month. And I asked each group of mothers, please send us 10 mothers a day only. And here was young Abuna Shakur with 300 most beautiful and very generous mothers coming every morning to prepare sandwich and drinks for 5,000. Mm. Mm. And they made the miracle. Yeah. They made it. God bless these mothers. Some of my listeners might be tempted to say, can that be true? You have such a beautiful Christian community. In fact, I would invite you to come and experience the generosity of the Christians in the Middle East and mainly in Galilee. But the reality was that not all those mothers who came every day were Christians. Very often the majority of those mothers coming were Muslim mothers. That reminded me that we Christians, whether we are Baptists or Roman Catholics or Greek Catholics, we do not have the monopoly of doing good. And we do not have an exclusive control over the activity of the Holy Spirit. That's very, very important, you know. And can you tell us something about Ma Elias educational institutions today? Yes. Let me speak about the beginning, please. A mm. few seconds. Uh, this big summer camp in 1980 was the end of my summer camp because the dignitaries of the village started pressuring on me. Stop your summer camps. You don't want them. I said, why? They said, we don't need you to take care three weeks a year for of our children. There are another 11 months plus in the year. Nobody cares for our children. And we want you to do that. I was not sent here to do that. But they convinced me. They were so convincing. They said, what do we need for your summer camp? Three weeks a year, that's nothing. We want the high school. I said, okay, I will try. I did not have money, in fact. I did not have any plan to make a school. But I took the, the, the will of the people. I said, if God speaks through these people, it means it's what I have to do. And I applied for a building permit, 1980. And the answer came three months later from the Israeli government. Deny it. You're not allowed to build a school. They probably wanted to build a settlement here in the, the area. Yeah. But I went there before them. I said, okay, they deny me the right to build a school, but I want a school for our children. I took that paper and said, what do you need, Elias, to have a school? Do you need a building permit or you need a building? I said, no, I need the building, not the building permit. Mm -hmm. The authority needs the building permit. So I started the construction without building permit in case of Asura. This is how everything started. Three months after we started, the police came. Mm -hmm. Where is your building permit? I said, I don't have a building permit. He said, how do you build without building permit? I said, sir, don't you know, I always build with sand, cement, steel, stone, and so on, not with permit. And the police was outraged. So you don't do like that in a civilized country. I said, I wish you were civilized enough. If you were, you would have given me a building permit. But if I build without building permit, it's only in order to help you become a little bit more civilized, Mr. The police could have killed me. He said, we stop arguing now. You are someone to court, and this building will be destroyed. It's just the building behind us, the old one. I said, okay. He turned away and disappeared. As soon as he disappeared, disappeared a few minutes later, we started again the construction. We resumed the work. And we finished nine months later. We opened the doors. We had 82 children, mm -hmm. aged 13, 14 years old. We had four teachers. 
one lady and three men. Twenty years later, I was so grateful, so happy to, to, to welcome every morning, you won't believe it, 4,500 students mm. coming from 70 different towns and villages, mm. from the Negev to the mm. Upper Galilee. This mm. is how the school started. It's a love story. Mm. It's much more than that. It's a story of a cross. I was constantly on the cross because I was never able to get a building permit. Till I became Archbishop 11 years ago, I was 37 times in court, always for building permits. Mm. Mm. For this building right here, the gym, I knocked on the doors of Israelis for six years to have a building permit without any result. Then I said, goodness, don't you know that the shortest way to Jerusalem passes through Washington, D.C.? Go to Washington, D.C. and knock on the highest door. And I put a flight ticket and landed at National Airport in Washington. Mm. You know, this is an airport inside the city of Washington, not around, not in the neighborhood. I rented a car and I drove to Vauxhall Road, number 17 which was the residence of the Secretary of State, American State, James Baker. I parked and went to the entrance door. I knocked on the door. He was not there. His wife, Susan Baker, bless her heart, came herself to open the door. And that's a very big anomaly, right? Mm. That such ladies never open their doors. Mm. They have the valley so open for them. <laughs> for many consider security, status, everything. She opened the door, I, he, uh, here I was. She was shocked. She was expecting some more American ladies to come in. Mm. And here I am, I don't look like a lady. She was very shocked, she said, who are you? I said, Madam, I am another man from Galilee. Mm. You know, when we say the man from Galilee, mm. we mean Jesus Christ, right? Mm. So when I say I'm another man from Galilee, it's either crazy or pretentious, mm. but it's a reality. She said, do you have an appointment with us? I said, Madam, we men from Galilee, we never make appointments, we make appearances. <laughs> Poor Susan Baker, she was utterly confused. She, she invited me in to the right side door of her residence, right away to the kitchen. Because they had such a beautiful kitchen. I could stay my life mm. there. She gave me something to, drink, something to drink that I hate. Up till now, I did not repeat that uh, awful uh, drink. A glass of iced tea. How does she? How does do you in America Australia drink iced tea? Well, that's your problem. <laughs> And I swallowed that, and while she said, now you have your drink, Mr. Shakur, you have to go because I am busy with 20 American ladies. I was already on the exit door. We are having a Bible study hour. I said, wow, what kind of Bible study hour now? I said, we are having a look on the so-called Sermon on the Mount. I said, wow, good luck. I pity you. I said, why do you pity me? I said, because what will you understand from that? It was not written by an American. And it was not written in your language. But in my, in my, one of my Semitic languages, the one who wrote is a simple peasant next door to my village. Good luck, man. And Susan Baker said, can you help us understand it better? Mama, what could I expect better than that? I was invited this time, no more to the kitchen, but to the living room with the 20 American ladies. And I started explaining the Sermon on the Mount. It took me two hours to explain the eight first verses of the Sermon on the Mount, which you in the West call them sometimes the blessings, some other times the beatitude. And when you want to be extravagant, you call them the be happy attitude. 
I was given that book from George Shore while in a quick visit to Waco. I said to him, Mr. George, I accept to take this book in my hand because you are a human being. But it's the most anti-human, anti-Christian title of any book. But that's okay. Uh, and I, after two hours, I left two copies of my books, Blood Brothers of New Berlin, the Land, to Susan Baker, and I left to the hotel where I spent one night and came back here. That's all I did in Washington. While I was sitting in my office one week later, the telephone rang. It was Susan Baker on the telephone. Can we pray together? I said, why? Why not? She started praying on the telephone. Then I continued a few sentences after she finished. I was amazed. I never imagined I would be going to Washington to speak with Almighty God on the telephone. Here we don't use the telephone for God. We speak directly with Him. But in America, I do like Americans do. This operation repeated itself twice, three times in a month. More than once, a third person would interrupt our prayer, saying, it's my time to pray, you listen now. I have only a few minutes. It was the Secretary of State himself. Mm -hmm. He prayed with us. Mm -hmm. After two months, mm -hmm. I ceased being this strange fellow who knocked on our door, this bearded oriental priest who said, I'm another man from Galilee. I became Abuna. And the Abuna is the lovely name we give to our parish priest, our father, to remind him that he has to behave as if he's our father. And we'll behave with him as if we were his children. That's how the people call me here, Abuna. Not your grace, not your excellency. I don't like that. Mm. I am Abuna. And what kind of work does the Ma Elias institutions do today? First of all, we have 3,500 mm. students every morning. Mm. We give them everything that's common to all high school in the country. In addition to that, we give them our view about human dignity, human rights, about uh, unity within diversity. This is extremely important. Yeah? And they experience really the unity within the diversity since our children come from almost 45 villages. Mm. If, they would, if we don't have the school, they would not have experienced anything but their small, small, close-minded village mentality. And I read somewhere that this is the only educational institution in the Galilee, historically, that, that's ever brought together the four major religions around a vision of peace. Yeah. yeah. You know, from the very beginning, I wanted the school to be a Christian school. A very clearly Christian school with Christian values, Christian vision, Christian way of life. I wanted that so seriously that whenever I prayed, I said, how can you want to have a Christian school without being open to the others who are not Christian around you? Mm. That's why being a Christian, we need to open up, not our doors, but our hearts. And it's not enough to open our hearts. We need to open our doors. Mm. And I opened doors mm. for mm. the next neighbors who were the Muslims. And they started streaming to the school. Now we have 60% of our students are Muslim boys and girls. Very nice, very beautiful boys and girls. Mm. I love them affectionately. Yeah. The same thing for Jews. I spent the whole year 1999 going from one Jewish village to another, from one Jew, from kibbutz, Jewish kibbutz to another kibbutz, meeting with the committees of parents and trying to convince them to send their children to our school. I was able to convince 80 families and they sent us 80 children from different places. In the year 2000, in September, uh, opening the school year. I was waiting for the children to come to school. 
after the long holidays. At the end of this procession, I saw the Jewish bus coming up to the school. I became very afraid suddenly. I said, what did I do? Did I bring the devil to my camp? How can I place 10 Jewish children in each classroom with my Palestinian children and my Muslim children? The Arabs would, would kill them. They would tear them into pieces because they are all coming from villages who are either destroyed or they were uh, left without land. Uh, their land was confiscated and they are very frustrated. So I did not let the Jew go into classrooms. Instead, I ordered four buses who came immediately and I loaded them with our Palestinian Christians and Muslims and then went to the Jewish bus and said, boy, these are your children now. You have to love them as you love your other children. I greeted them and ordered them to go down to subdivide themselves in smaller groups and go into the four buses. And they will go together to Mount Carmel in the fresh air till the evening and we'll see what we can do later. Hmm. Was done. I ordered the teachers, you go spend the day in the open air in Mount Carmel. When you come, we'll see what we do. I was kind of released. Hmm. I was waiting for their return at four o'clock to see how many Jews were injured, were insulted, were har harassed, were... But the bus is parked. Imagine these children never got down step by step from the bus. They jumped out from the doors like little monkeys. And it was absolutely clear that they forgot that they were Jews and Arabs, Palestinians and Israelis. They discovered that they were just kids. Oh, beautiful mm. just kids, adorable. From that time on, I am almost fighting, struggling to have integrated schools where Jews and Palestinians can learn together. Not each one in his own uh, school with two different curricula. The one is written by an Israeli team, and that very team writes the curricula for the Arabs in accordance. And that's not helping to make peace. From that on, I, I preach about the need to build peace around the desktops of the school. If one Jew here, one Christian, one Muslim, one Druze, they will discover things, they will enjoy things. And then we can ask them to write the common future they want for themselves. Otherwise, there is no hope for Israel. Hmm. All the time, the system remains segregated. That means that Jews would remain foreigners in the Middle East Israel has no hope to survive. How do you think that in a land, it isn't only Israel now that's very conflicted and divided, it feels like the world is becoming more divided actually and more segregated. What role do Christian leaders have to play in, in helping people of all ethnicities and religions begin to, to come together as neighbors and friends? I think we have our humble role to play. Hmm. I don't pretend that we have the role to solve the Palestinian conflict, but we have the responsibility to create a human relations with smaller groups. We consider the big picture is hopeless. Israel versus Palestine. As long as they are fighting together, either they will annihilate each other, God forbids, or they will survive together. But now the prospect is not very optimistic. But we have the, the smaller picture, the relation person to person, group to group, community to community, and that's possible. And that's what we are trying to create. Where do you see signs of hope in this land? And my children, and my Jewish teachers here, I have mm. 30 Jewish teachers, and my Muslim mm. teachers, and the simple people who yearn for peace and hate to have more wars. 
You know, Israel is very powerful, militarily speaking. They have all the weapons imaginable. But they are the most frightened people on earth. Because one, one thing can destroy Israel. It's the weapons of Israel. Only the weapons of Israel. And one thing can save Israel is peace with the Palestinians and peace in the Middle East. Yeah. What gives you most joy in your work? Oh, my joy, my greatest joy is the children. When I go up to the playground, I see Muslim girls with Christian girls, with Christian boys, Muslim boys together. I see this is a future one together. What gives me hope is what happened only three weeks ago, just before Christmas. We made a colloquium, we invited a Muslim sheikh with a rabbi and with a Christian priest to speak about Christmas. And the Muslim sheikh of the village here stood up at the end and said, I am not happy. I want you to come to the mosque and there we will have a whole evening speaking about the role of Jesus in the Quran and the birth of Christ in the Quran. I said, I, oh, I should. I thought he was joking. I said, okay, do it. Okay, it's next Thursday you are invited all. Next day I went there. There were about 400 adults ready to listen about Christ for two hours in the, in the mosque from Muslim speakers. It was something most beautiful. It was the outcome of what I started doing in the village in 65, when I was sent here for one month. I said, what can I do in one month? I said, okay, I can do something that would not cost me money and something that's available to do. I will go and visit every family in the village. I will start with the Muslim families. And we create a bond of friendship, of respect, of uh, mutual respect from that time. And I know that I'm supported very often, much more by the Muslim than by the Christians locally. And this invitation to the mosque was almost the closing of the circle, the perfection of the circle. In one of your books, you challenge people to embrace a biblical vision of justice yeah. and peace. What kind of challenge would you make to our audience watching this interview today? Justice is a very complicated concept in the, in the Bible. Mm. I did not know what I meant in those times. Mm. I know now what I meant. Mm. That justice cannot be exclusive justice. It has to be a distributive justice. Yeah. It has to be shared justice to make life for everybody possible. Yeah. And from justice, we can hope to be in peace. But peace without justice is only a fallacy. Mm. It's not possible. And justice without peace is an utopia. Yeah. So they are combined together, peace and justice, justice toward peace. Peaceful justice. And I never excluded the Jews of the need for justice. They need justice so badly, but they never asked for justice. They always asked for peace, for peace, peace, but they never got any peace. I survived already 11 wars in Israel. That's far too much for one person because they want shalom, peace, peace and they got only war after war after war. While we Palestinians, we always wanted justice and only justice, nothing but justice. And we got misery, upper misery, upper misery. And you see the situation of Palestinians today is the worst in the world because we wanted justice for ourselves without having it for the Jews. And the Jews wanted peace for themselves, no matter what about the other. And that's a wrong, wrong, wrong mm. attitude. Mm. 
What's most misunderstood about the things you say? Do you ever hear somebody talk about what you're saying and you think, actually, no, that isn't what I'm saying or that, that isn't what I'm proposing? Yeah. You know, whatever I said mm. can be misunderstood, can be misinterpreted, can be considered as something against the one who hears it. One-sided, but I'm not one-sided. I know all the bad things, the injustices that the Jews inflicted on us. I know that they kicked us out from our village without any reason. We had three resolutions of the High Court of Justice of Israel that we have the right to return. When we got the third resolution, the Israeli army sent its airplanes and destroyed all my village. They confiscated our land. They destroyed our church. And I am not happy about that. I want it to be corrected. It does not mean I want what has been done to us to be repeated from our hands towards others. One evil cannot heal another evil. And well, Shimon Peres came here uh, 10 years ago. He was foreign minister of Israel. And I asked him to, I, I told him, Mr. Perez, I'm standing in front of you as a deportee from Baram. The village has been destroyed, but the villages are still alive and they are asking to return back home. He answered me in front of 150 persons. Your Grace, you left Baraam when you were eight or nine years old, right? I said, yes. He said, that's long, long ago. You did not yet forget Baraam being your native place. Tell me, how long would it take you to forget that Baraam is your native village? I said, I'm sorry, Mr. Perez. You blame me for remembering my dignity and my right. And you do not remember that you were kicked out from here 2,000 years ago by a Roman emperor, not by a Palestinian. And we were there and we stayed there waiting for your return and you will come to you when you came to our home. And you did not forget that Palestine is your homeland. Tell me, when are you going to forget that? That would help you to forget Baram. He answered one word, touche. But I know he had tears in his eyes. What's your dream and hope for this land and for its peoples? <laughs> Peace and justice. Peace and justice. My dream for myself, I know that it's a wrong dream because it will never, never be uh, fulfilled, is to go back home, to build a small room in my father's land and die there. Because that land is the only place in the world, which means for me the continuation of a long, long procession of Christianity we started 2,000 years ago. And I want that to continue. Elias Shoko, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Please, I greet you and I hope that those who listen to us will get to know their vocations of being Christians. I mean, they know that they are followers of Jesus Christ, which includes follow him up to the cross. But not before the cross, they would change their color, like a chameleon. We do not have any chameleon vocation. Christianity is something totally different from chameleon uh, vocation. We are not invited to change our color in order to survive physically. We are called to go ahead, even accept to be destroyed physically. And so what with this? If they destroy me, so what? They will be criminal. 
But for me, it's a problem of three days after which the resurrection comes. And that's what I wish to ask the Christians who listen to me. Please have a Christian vocation. Know where you are going and do not back up. Like Christ on the cross, he would have been able to curse those who crucified him. And everybody would say they deserve that. But he did not say they deserve that. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. This is our Christian vocation. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining please, us today. Please, I thank you for coming here. The Global Church Project is located at www.theglobalchurchproject.com. On our website, you'll find a wide range of interviews and resources for colleges, universities, and churches. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.